Hi. Uh, uh, it is Janet Fitch, and it is noon on Wednesday. Uh, so that means it's Writing Wednesday, where I answer your writing questions. Um, so if you have questions for me, uh, put them in the comments below. Um, uh, you can also write to me at uh, uh, on my website, JanetFitchWrites.com, um, and I can even design a Writing Wednesday around your question. So don't hesitate. Um, I hope you... Um, uh, hi, Shona! I just taught a, law, a weekend intensive on writing dialogue in fiction and uh, how dialogue fictional dialogue is very different than dialogue in the movies or in uh, a play and certainly very mm -hmm. different than dialogue in our daily lives which is more conversation than dialogue uh, dialogue is a very specific thing in fiction um, it's two people doing things to each other um, in hey carla Shona, we have two uh, of the participants in our, hi Janine, in our, uh, um, who were in the workshop, uh, the intensive workshop. Uh, and Janine says, I use subtext every day with my boyfriend. Yes, yes. Let's talk about subtext. Uh, this was a question that somebody asked last week. And because I was getting ready to teach a huge weekend intensive five two-hour sessions on different aspects of fiction writing I wasn't um, kind of in the mood to spend um, you know uh, half hour hour on something I was already geared up to do so now uh, that workshop is over and uh, I thought I would address his question um, about what is subtext and how is it used in fiction okay well the diff what's the difference between, first of all, between um, uh, fiction on the page and uh, dialogue on the page and dialogue in a screenplay or a, a, in a play? Uh, the difference is that in dialogue in, uh, on the page, we can do the internal world of the character as well as... Um, the externals. We have the character can react to things in their heads and say something completely different. Um, so we can burrow a little more deeply into subtext uh, if we want to. So what is subtext? Subtext is what is not said. Subtext is, you know, it's that when uh, Janine says, I use subtext every day with my boyfriend, you know, uh, it's asking your daughter if she's going out like that. You know, the subtext is the mother's disapproval of what is being worn. But she doesn't have to say much. She can say a bit, and people, especially who know each other very well, pick up on that subtext really fast. You know, if you want to see, um, usually if you want to see a teenage kid get really mad really fast, uh, the mother can simply say, are you, is that what you're wearing to grandma's house? <laughs> because everybody understands what the subtext is. Um, and generally when people are in conflict, they are not arguing about what they seem to be arguing about. What's on the surface um, is um, ostensibly they're, talking about the cap on the toothpaste, the toilet seat lid, um, the quality of the dinner or whatever. But they're really arguing about deeper issues, you know, about their relationship, about, uh, uh, you know, approval, disapproval, um, that kind of thing. So, so subtext is where the fiction, I'm, Janine says, I'm fine is never fine. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so when people are extremely direct with each other, you don't need subtext. You know, I'm really tired of how you treat me. 
you know, make your own damn dinner. That's very direct. If it's making the dinner and it's burnt and uh, the husband uh, doesn't want to eat a burnt dinner, you know, it's, you can use objects for subtext that they hold, ob it's called uh, the objective correlative. That burned dinner is a symbol of this uh, person's anger. You know, she's making dinner or he's making dinner for somebody who uh, they're angry at. And they can say, oh, how is it? Oh, fine, I'm so sorry. I. I burnt the dinner, you know, Pfft. yeah, I burned it because I was pissed. Um, hi, Karen. Oh, there's somebody else from the workshop. How wonderful. Good to see you. Um, so use, you can use objects to express subtext, sounds express subtext. You mm -hmm. can do it with, um, um, uh, sound you can do it with landscape um uh we were we read um a short story of of uh robert stones where uh, a guy sees storm clouds way out to sea and it's a beautiful day but he sees those dark clouds you know that subtext um you can read a scene like a dream, like a scene in a dream, what things mean, uh, you interpret what they mean. And subtext requires interpretation. Um, so it's like, oh, I forgot to plug in my phone. <laughs> I'm going to have a little battery power problem. Uh, let's see if I can uh, borrow a battery to plug this into so we don't have a problem uh, while we talk here. Um, I Let's see if there's a battery that works here. We'll have to see. I'm going to plug it in. Mm -hmm. Sorry to walk around with my phone, but uh, I'm not... I'm not quite the professional that I appear to be. Okay, I'll plug it in over here and just hold it. Okay, there we go. We'll be, we'll be juiced up in no time. So it's talking about um, subtext being something that one can um, interpret. And it's what we mean by subtext is when we have to interpret things instead of just knowing them. Like, for instance, how are you? Fine. You know, said in a certain way is an invitation to um, interpret the gesture, interpret what I'm saying. You know, yeah, I'm fine. I'm so fine. Um, hi, Linda. Oh, it's another... Uh, another uh, workshop attendee. Um, so talking about sub, a little more about subtext. The, um, you can use objects. You can look out the window, say a uh, kid is getting uh, balled out by mom, uh, and mm -hmm. he can look out the window and see another kid, um, you know, playing, playing in the street, playing, you know, riding his bike or something. And that gives you a subtext. You know what the uh, character is thinking by what he sees out the window. Subtext is useful for a number of, it, it's used in a number of things, but what, what it requires is a trust in the reader. It's a little puzzle that you're trusting the reader to want to figure out and figure out. So it's, um, it's like the, the boyfriend who wants you to read his mind. I mean, in real life, we don't want to read the boyfriend's mind. In real life, a psychologist, a therapist will tell you, marriage therapist, will tell you, you don't have to read the other person's mind. It's up to them to get to the point. But in fiction, we're not talking about self-improvement. We're not talking about 
about saving the relationship. We don't care about saving the relationship. What we're watching is how people behave under stress and how they put stress, how they put um, stress on each other. So subtext is reading the emotional content of the dialogue, what's actually, there's what's being said by the characters, and then there's what are they really saying when they say that. Um, people, it, it enriches your fiction. If everyone just comes out and says what they're thinking, you know, Martha, I think it's time for us to break up. Oh, well, I don't want to break up with you, Henry. I think we still have some good years in us. Uh, nevertheless, June, uh, I do want, where's this, you know, where's the dimensionality of that dialogue? It's, it's just super flat. And where's the emotion? We don't know what the emotion is. It's so much more um, rich and subtle to have um, rich, you know, the guy come in and say, um, you know, I'm not so sure about going to Morocco this summer. And then the subtext is, I want to break up. But he's not just going to come out and say it. He's going to talk about the trip, trip to Morocco that they've been saving up for and dreaming about. And, you know, it's a shared dream that he's going to start extracting himself from. So... One of the great pleasures of reading well-written literature is that the reader is becomes more active. The reader isn't just sitting back being told this, oh, we're going to break up, we're not going to go to Morocco, we're going to break up. Um, the reader is an active companion in a scene where there's subtext because the reader is trying to figure it out. You're trusting the reader to pick up the cues and it's a much more interesting um, scene when the reader is part of it. I know as a reader, I like to be active. I like to be trying to figure out what's going on. I like trying to pick up the signals just like any other human being. We, we like to practice those skills of picking up the subtext because so much of life is, I mean, nobody ever comes out and just says what they want. You know, everybody beats around the bush. So we've become very good at reading signals and we like to use that when, when it comes to our own reading pleasure. It's an extra pleasure to go, oh my God, they're going to are they? Is that what's going to happen? Oh, I think so. So it gets the reader, it let, lets the reader have an active reading experience where they can discern the meaning of things for themselves. And a lot of it is like reading a dream. If anybody's ever done dream analysis, it's a really, really useful tool for a writer uh, to learn how... Um, how to see the things as symbols of other things and things that mean other things. Um, uh, you know, and as a reader, it's very useful. The other thing that you use um, subtext is, becomes extremely important is when um, there is something too intense for the characters to put their, to really come out and say, you know, I'm, I'm gay, mom. Uh, you know, I'm dying. You know, um, that we're not going to keep this kid. Um, there are a lot of, I, I used the uh, example uh, of a couple of abortion stories in the uh, dialogue workshop, The Hills Like White Elephants uh, by Hemingway. And uh, there's a scene in Joan Didion's Played As It Lays uh, where she's being driven to a, uh, to, or she's driving uh, and somebody is taking her for an illegal abortion. Um, and they talk about cars I mean, there's so much subtext in that, talking about cars, um, you know, society's disapproval and the un 
an ability to, to talk about the deeper issues. So we talk about kind of have myth, misdirection. You know, we talk about trivialities when there's a huge looming thing that we can't talk about. So that's a wonderful use of subtext. Um, you, you discern subtext from the reader's point of view um, when the actions don't match what is being said. You know, um, when somebody is uh, saying, like, sure, sure, I agree with you, and, you know, shaking their head or not even being able to look at you, you know, of course I love you, you know, as I'm not even looking at you. Um, so one thing that's a really you know, kind of a touchstone about how to think about subtext or ask yourself if, if there is subtext there, um, is to imagine there being subtitles under the dialogue, under what people are saying. Imagine there being subtitles of what they really are saying, what they really mean, what's really going on in their heads. Imagine... I guess uh, in Annie Hall, there there's that those subtitles under which you know under the dialogue. Uh, you know, I don't have any tuna tuna, like I want a tuna sandwich. I have no, there is no tuna, and the this you know under this that you might subtitle. I I'm not. I don't think of you when I go to the market. I don't really care about your needs. Oh, I forgot to get some tuna. Um, in life, we get into all kinds of knots when there's a lot of subtext, um, when people expect people to rem you know, read their minds, when people read too much into what people are saying. Um, you know, you're off to the marriage counselor. But in fiction, it's a really good move. So keep it in there. Don't Don't send anybody to a therapist in fiction. Let them have a big fight about it, you know. Um, hey, Zunaid. So let them have their, uh, uh, when words don't match actions, when people say they're sorry and they, you know, are clearly, you know, bouncing a tennis ball on the tennis racket. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, you're not. You're ready to play tennis. Um, so that's a, that is subtext right there. Um, so imagine the subtitles and then wipe them out because this is what the, the, the reader should be gleaning from the clues in your story. Uh, another thing that's very good is, is, uh, double meanings, you know, um, double entendres, you know, you can read the subtext from when people say things that mean a couple of different things, uh, your boss is like, you know, throwing this double entendres at you, uh, kind of sexual connotations. And, and then they get really upset if you claim that, you know, what are you coming on to me? It's like, oh, no, of course not. You know, you just have a dirty mind. You know, the reader's like, yeah, yeah, he said it. Uh huh. A lot of gaslighting there's subtext there. Um, uh, people change the subject, you know, that's when you get too close to what the underlying problem is or what's, what, what the subtext is. When one character is getting too close, the other character will change the subject. You know, when the husband and wife finally one of them is like, you know what, you just can't stand me, can you? Uh, you know, and the other person is not ready to admit that. They will think, you know, oh my God, I forgot I have to pick Joey up at the, you know, at soccer. And it's like, yeah, you have to pick Joey up in an hour. <laughs> they change the subject, you know. Did you ever hear from, you know, the plumber? It's like, we're starting to talk about like the sh deep shit and now we're you want to change the subject subtext um uh they get physical you know instead of 
if somebody, if pressed, they'll do something, you know, take pluck lint off their shirt or something, you know. You can use an action in there to indicate we're getting too close to the subtext. Um, what else? I, I'm working on a scene right now. That's my notes. I'm working on a scene right now uh, in this new book I'm working on. And I have a, a couple of, uh, of people who knew each other in high school. And there's been some very weird issues uh, there. And it's they've just had like a sexual encounter. And um, one of them is like, can I call you? And one of the other one is like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't understand a thing. You know, it's like, all right, I call you. So of course that person does understand. They just can't um, internalize it yet. It means that they've been very, they've been upended. Uh, they, and they can't res resolve that they actually do understand. So they're hiding in their conf in in a in an appearance of confusion. Something they they really do understand. It's just upsetting to them. They can't say no. This whole thing is really upsetting to me. I need time to process. You know that's what your therapist would like you to say. We don't care about therapists. We don't care about being you know uh, therapized people in fiction. We want to be the people in the naked state and. So you, you know, my character uh, hides behind a posture of, I don't understand anything. <laughs> and then the other person is like, well, I'll call you. <laughs> because they're not drawn into it. And they're commenting on the subtext, which is, I'm really into you and it's freaking me out. You know, they're not getting caught up in, in the you know, the bit of misdirection that my character's throwing out there. Um, you can answer a question with a question. You know, when somebody is really pressing, a character is really pressing another character to get closer to the subtext, uh, and the character is resisting, they often answer with a, another question. You know, how long do you really expect me to go on uh, putting up with this? Well, how long have you has it been? You know, or how how much time do you have? Or, you know, they they uh, they just zing it back. Um, so great subtext scenes. You can most movies. Um, you know, we're talking. We're not talking about writing screenplays, but we're talking about um, we're talking about um, film uses a lot of subtext. Um, because they can't even go into the person's mind to know what they're really thinking. So the audience, the other character, is always watching the behavior of actors, getting looking for clues to what's really going on. Uh, so they'll say something very mild, but we'll watch how they behave. As fiction writers, you, you're the actor. You know, you have to write the character's reaction, what they're doing to control their, often it's just to control their intensity. You have, um, in life, you have many characters, maybe most characters, who are not used to talking about their feelings. And it's, you know, yep and nope and, uh, you know, you're going to need an oil change on that truck, you know. You can have, if they're their point of view character, you can know what they're thinking. So you see, um, you know, Harold was terrified that he was going to be losing Marianne, you know. Um, I, can, I can do an oil change on that truck if you like i.e. I'm desperately in love with you and don't and want to be useful to you. That's the subtext. But, uh, you know, all he can think of is to give her a free oil change, <laughs> um, which she can choose to pick up the subtext or not. Um, 
there's a wonderful scene in um, Last Tango in Paris. Uh, we're talking about using objects and using landscape. There's a wonderful scene where um, the husband of a dead woman who has committed suicide, uh, he go uh, here. Her lover lives in the same hotel that she owns. She was the landlady, and the husband goes to the lover's room, knocks on the room. The the, uh, the lover opens the door, and they're wearing exactly the same bathrobe. <laughs> you know, and they both knew that they were, you know, who they were to her, but they never talked about it. It was totally subtext. And it continues to be subtext of their conversation as they sit there in the same bathrobe. Um, the way uh, the husband talks to the dead wife. Um, it's like, uh, you know, the subtext can be, he can talk about her food. He can talk about her, you know, how I use that in, in uh, a line from um, Painted Black, my second novel, where uh, a guy talks about his wife who died, made him a refrigerator full of food before, you know, prepared food before she died. So the, the gesture is like, I'm going to try to take care of you from the grave. And the, of course, the husband can't eat that food because the loss of his wife was so great that he just can't swallow it. He can't accept that she's gone. He can't swallow the food that she's made for him. It's just too upsetting. Um... So we were talking about the, the Hemingway. Hemingway was wonderful with subtext. He didn't like to do a lot of um, internals, very cut and dried world. Um, uh, so the t subtext is pretty thick and you have to hang in there and watch the characters and watch for the reveals. Uh, very, very... Um, skillful and um, small reveals of the subtext of what's what's going on in those scenes. So let's see, do we have any questions here about f using subtext? Um, and it's not just for I mean, it's used in all kinds of situations. It doesn't, it just adds another layer of reality of people's emotion and what things mean to them to, um, to the scenes you've already got. It, it enriches the scene. So um, say a guy in a crime novel, a guy is being pulled over again, um, for no real reason, except the cop wants to uh, question him about something. And, you know, oh, your tail light is out. Your tail light is out means I want to have a word with you. Maybe search your car. Um, it doesn't just mean your tail light's out anymore. Um, it's a whole threat. It's a whole symbol system. Uh, these little, these little things like one word. Um, from a cop in a tense situation will tell the driver, you know, about a hundred years of really scary stuff. You know, it is such an implied threat. Uh, somebody who is a, um, a, a violent person, say you're married to a very violent person, you know, they can just say one little thing and you're afraid for your life. Um, because, you know, you've been harmed by that person plenty. You know what that, that one little thing. So the best dialogue is always between people who know each other very well, have history together, uh, so that they understand what each other means. Uh, I used a bit of a Joan Didion um, scene from Play It As Lays, which is a remarkable book. I love it, uh, where... 
a husband and a wife have this very short scene. It's a whole chapter in like eight lines of dialogue. And it's, you know, uh, what have you been doing? Nothing, nothing. Well, maybe a little something. And press again, you know, well, who have you been seeing? Oh, nobody. Well, so-and-so and so-and-so. And, so -and, -so. and then he has a line about one of the people she mentions, you know, like, don't get into that. And she goes, well, he's your friend. Um, so the subtext, it's all subtext. We have no idea who this person is. We have no idea what they're talking about. But the, particip the active participatory reader is, you know, loves that kind of puzzle because now we're going to watch if that person appears in a scene, we're going to watch that scene and go, well, what does that mean? You know, what's, what's with that guy? Um, so it, the subtext is not only a, um, a tool in your dialogue. It's a, it's a gift to your reader for an active reader to give them something to do and a puzzle to figure out and be part of the, process of reading the novel and not just um you know this where everything's explained everything's given to you on a, you know on a platter um if you know it's like a movie where uh somebody does ha, uses an object uh, and then you have the insert the close-up of the hammer with the blood on it you know it's like yeah yeah we got it you know they bludgeoned him with a hammer you don't have to give us the subtext you know, let us, let us figure it out. Um, let's see, using objective correlatives, using objects that stand for things, you know, I mean, all an abusive parent has to do is pick up the belt. And as a novelist, you describe the belt. You don't have to say, my father beat me up with that belt. You know, just the intensity of the uh, apprehension of the object tells us. Let's see if I have anything else I can tell you on this subject or other or other subjects. Um, or just any random questions before we finish. Here, I think I can unplug the camera now. I think I, this will have enough juice to last us the rest of the session. I don't mean to make you um, ill walking around with the camera. There we go. <laughs> We're back. Ah, the miracle of technology. So su subtext is the unspoken part of dialogue. It's what is not being said. And you can talk about it in the interior, character's interior, or you can leave it and let the reader puzzle it out. Um, but in dialogue, good dialogue, the point of view character is always watching the other person and trying to gauge their, rea their reactions to things, that, as we do in life. We watch the other person will say something, and then we'll watch to see what their reaction is. Do they understand the subtext? Do they understand the signal that I just put out? Um, how are they reacting to that? Um, we use gesture, you know, instead of they, the person might not say, I don't, I don't buy what you're saying. They might just like brush their coat off. It's a brush off. It's like, that's what I mean by dream language. This is a brush off. So it means something. The gesture implies a, uh, um, a thought. A gesture implies a reaction. Um, if I am uh, talking to you and you're like really, really trying to tell me something and I look at my watch... That's a message. I didn't have to say anything. You know, I'm not just looking to see what time it is. I'm saying I've had enough of this conversation. You know, 
Do I have something I have to do? How long has he been going on? Um, that's why using gestures is really important, is learning, not just sticking in a random gesture to break up dialogue, but using gesture to speak for the person, say something he doesn't want to say. Um, oh, then I, I, um, put a note to myself the, on the, what does this mean? On the nose, on the nose, on the nose means the dialogue is too close to the subtext. You're telling the subtext and people are disappointed by that. People feel cheated when somebody says, oh, you mean you think I'm too fat? It's like, you've just ruined the game. You know, uh, the dialogue is much more interesting when it's not quite on the nose, you know. Do you like caftans? That's more interesting. <laughs> um, so you don't want to kill your subtext by just coming out and saying it. Let people be more subtle. Let people be more clever and subtle and funny and irritating and all the things that happen when they don't quite address the issue. Let them, you know, evade in various ways and suggest and symbolize and um, shorthand and all the other ways in which people can be indirect. Um, and so you want the underlying meaning to remain underlying. It can come out eventually, but keep it subtle. Keep the, the actual verbalization on the subtle side. Um, t uh, an act in acting, I found this on an acting site. The text is the words that they're they're being spoken. The subtext is the emotional charge of the idea. The interior of the unconscious drives memories and objectives. So every, in every scene, a char every character has an objective. They have a goal. They want something, you know? And so they usually don't tell you what it is that is their desire. Um, that's, it comes out, it's, we read it. it, we read into it. That's where the active participant of the reader comes in. Um, so allow your readers to be active participants. Don't overlook the possibilities of playing, people playing with each other, people only admitting a part of what they're thinking, um, of people maybe even acting, you know, what a shrink would call acting out, where you don't know that's what you mean. But you, you know, sometimes there's a Freudian slip. You don't mean to say something that you say, and then you deny having said it. Um, sometimes it's an action, like accidentally breaking something uh, that belongs to somebody you don't like. Um, it's symbolic meanings of objects and actions. So um, uh, somebody, I, I still remember my grandmother getting a, a pot of cr yellow chrysanthemums for kind of a welcome or congratulations gift from someone uh, in the building. And she was, oh, thank you so much. And then after that woman was gone, she put that flower pot outside the door. And uh, I asked her, why did she do that? And she said, uh, never accept a gift from somebody who doesn't like you. <laughs> you know, I mean, that would have been really interesting in a book. I, I could have somebody put those flowers out and then maybe the grandmother wouldn't actually say that um but maybe they would it's the it, it's just interesting to see the difference between the accept that 
that supposed acceptance of the gift and then um, what she did with it was fat, fascinating. Uh, and then her little mottos. She had lots of little mottos like that. Uh, any questions on this? Uh, if not, we will... Um, I wish you happy uh, subtext. Don't try it on your friends. Put it in your work. Uh, try to be more on the up and up with the people around you. But uh, in your work, you know, let your characters be uh, withholding, underplaying, misdirecting, gaslighting, all the other tricks of the trade. Um, and I wish you good writing, and uh, we will see you next week. If you have a question, please um, put it in the... Uh, uh, there's a contact sheet on my... Um, uh, on my website, JanetFitchWrites.com, that you can write to me and I'll do a Writing Wednesday around your question. Also, I'm offering for people who want to buy um, the Revolution of Marina M and or, and or Chimes of Lost Cathedral, my two Russian novels. Um, I'm making handmade um, book plates. So if you uh, would like uh, one of those Russian Russian novel book plates, uh, personalized, write to me through my website and I will make you a book plate for your Marina or your, uh, or your gift copy of Marina or chimes for someone in your, um, in, on your shopping list. Uh, it's very, they're very snowy and, and, uh, intense and a good winter's read. So I wish you good reading and, um, and talk to you next week. All right. Thanks.